You're listening to the Lone Star Play Podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Hey, y'all, Patrick here with Lone Star Play. Thank you so much for joining us on this special episode. Our guest today is Mick West. Who is Mick West? He is, I would describe him as, describe him as the world's leading UFO debunker. Uh, he prefers science skeptic, which I totally understand because he does more than just debunk, you know, UFO videos. And it's not like he's just out to debunk UFO videos. He just takes a look at UFO lore and tries to find the truth. That's the best way I would describe it. Um, he's a very, um, I don't know what the right word is. Like, uh, he divides people. Um, there's people that have a lot of hate for him, which, um, you know, don't really understand. Uh, and then there's people that support him. Uh, but what I love about him is he just doesn't get involved in any of that drama. He just sticks to the facts, like Dragnet, right? Just the facts. And, um... I've enjoyed, uh, I've had two conversations with him. I've enjoyed them quite immensely. Now, um, on our other channel, uh, Vetted, um, is where I posted our first interview with him. So if you don't know already, we have another channel called Vetted that's dedicated to the UFOs. Uh, but I want, after I spoke with him the first time um, for that channel and that interview, I wanted to... Um, do another interview where we just get to know Mick West because he has a fascinating story, okay? He's one of the co-creators of Tony Hawk Pro Skater, right? Arguably one of the best games of all time. Um, and he worked on Guitar Hero, Call of Duty, many other things. And it's just he just has this fascinating background. He's originally from the UK, moved to California in the early 90s, started this gaming company with a couple of buddies and just went on to do amazing things. Sell, he sold it retired and got into sort of uh he has a website called metabunk.com um, he first got into like contrails and then like 9 11 conspiracies he's got a couple books out basically like um you know to help you and your friends and family like get over conspiracy theories right like how to talk to them about this stuff and maybe make them see the light if you will um so i'll put links to his website so you can check it out and uh, both of his books um, and this interview is not about UFOs it's about getting to know Mick West and I thought a perfect place would be the Lone Star Plate channel now I also released it on our vetted channel as well uh, because I just thought it needed to go there too originally it wasn't supposed to it was just supposed to be on Lone Star Plate but I thought no 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 it's got to go there just because again uh, people just jump to conclusions with him without actually getting to know the guy in every interview he does he does so many interviews he's on the news right he's always the guy the news calls when they want the other side to ufos right not just believing in them but the other side they get him on now uh, i thought you know this would that'd be a good way to show who he is so anyway uh, without further ado, let's um, jump in to this interview with Mick West again. Just uh, what a fascinating background, fascinating conversation. Uh, you know, Google them, go down the rabbit hole uh, of Mick West interviews on YouTube. You'll be fascinated. Uh, I'll put a link to his Twitter, too. He's pretty active on Twitter. And he's just a fascinating guy. A uh, fascinating story. Fit right into Lone Star Plate. And um, yeah, super excited about it. So uh, you can watch it here or on another channel on Vetted. Uh, whatever you like. If you haven't already gone to Vetted and subscribe, please do that. You know, if you're into UFOs and want to know more about that stuff, uh, we do daily videos on there and interviews, and we've got some great stuff on there. So please check that out. So again, without further ado, let's jump in with Mick West. Getting to know Mick West. Let's do it. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hello. Hey, Mick. How we doing? Hey, Patrick. Good. How you doing? Yeah, man. I saw you were on uh, vacation, on holiday. How did that go? Yeah, I was in England uh, visiting family. It was uh, a mixed bag. <laughs> the weather was a bit uh, a bit iffy at times, and I oh, came no. down with, with bronchitis, but uh, just oh. about recovered now. It's my kind of scratchy voice. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, that stinks. I hate when you come back from vacation and you feel ill or whatever because then yeah. you need a vacation from the vacation <laughs> i do i'm still right. on vacation i think <laughs> yeah. oh right on look at you man well thanks again for joining us mick um yeah, I'm you're sorry yeah sorry you're not feeling well 
Nah, it's fine. I'm fine now. I'll do most of the talking. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, listen, man, I'm I'm uh, super excited to to dig into some stuff that maybe you don't get to talk about a lot, to be honest yeah. with you. I don't know. Um, Not for a while. So, yeah, right on. Um, look, uh, same thing as, as last time as far as like we're not live. Um, you know, we, we edit this uh, post. So if there's something, I don't know, if something cool. you bring up and you're just like, eh, let's cut that. No worries. Tell us. We'll we'll take it out. It's not a big deal at all. All right. Shouldn't be anything. I'm an open book. Yeah, right on. Me too. But, man. Uh, Do you need any water or anything before we get started? Back I'm good. I'm all, all. I'm all. Uh, I'm all set. Right on. I'm man. Ready to rumble. Excellent. Well, look, we'll just jump right in here. Um, I, I, um, I, I first have to say, man, I'm a huge fan of Tony Hawk. Uh, who doesn't say that to you that plays games? Like, holy cow! I wasted a lot of my youth, um, playing that game, uh, <laughs> for sure in the '90s, man. Um. So let's kind of just dive into like, I guess, let's start with sort of uh, Neversoft. And then I yeah. do want to dive into just how you got into developing games to begin with and what sort of sparked your interest there. But let's just start with with Neversoft, if you can explain a little a little bit about that company to us. Yeah, well, Neversoft um, was one of several kind of spin-offs in a way of a company called Malibu Interactive, uh, which which used to be called Cinemaware. And they did like a bunch of games like uh like uh giant ants coming out of the desert type thing. I can't remember what they were called. But this was this company in uh in 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 actually in Westlake Village in California, which is kind of near Malibu, but I guess they thought Malibu was uh well, actually they 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 merged with Malibu Comics at some point, which is why they changed the name. But yeah, what, what had happened was like I was working in England at, at a company called Ocean. A whole bunch of my friends were all moving to America. It was like this <laughs> this mass migration of of British programmers and artists. It's wow. kind of like a brain drain. And I guess uh, you know there was like a shortage of of programmers and artists in in the states in California, and there was a bunch of poorly paid programmers and artists in 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 England, and so we all got kind of sucked over one at a time. And I was one of the last few people to leave. And by the time I got there, people were kind of almost almost straight away, they were starting to leave and set up their own companies. So there was like three or four companies before me of like kind of combinations of British plus American people leaving to start their own companies. And then eventually I was approached uh, by Joel Jewett, who was an accountant, uh, actually an accountant at, at, at the comic company, not at the games company. Uh, and uh, he approached me and suggested we start a company, and so so we did, and uh, that's how NeverSoft was born. What what made you think I can start a company? Like that seems like a big <laughs> undertaking, right? Like how old were you at this time? Yeah, I, uh, let me think about how old I would have been. Uh, it it was in the nineties, like ninety six or something like that. Um. So yeah, I, I I would have been like in my mid twenties. Oh wow, yeah, that's a huge uh, jump, right? Like yeah, that's... yeah, because you know I was I was a uh, I, I left college a few you know, a few years earlier, started working in the British games industry, but I only worked there for like like five years or so. Um, so what I, I guess I would have been like twenty six, twenty seven, something like that. So yeah. Uh, I was young, and so I I thought I could do anything. <laughs> Plus, <laughs> I guess the the real reason I thought I could do it was was kind of that everybody else was doing it, and sure. uh, we'd already kind of gone down the road with some some friends of ours and uh, who wanted to start a company, and we all kind of got together and talked about it and like, wouldn't it be amazing, you know? Well, we, the the name was going to be Stonehenge because it's a bit like Stonehenge, but it was funny. Yeah, but it, it never sure. happens. Like, and then you know, <laughs> I think you know, other people split off, and you know, eventually, we just um, it seemed inevitable you know, because the I guess Malibu wasn't doing very well in terms of the games department. Everybody was either leaving to get jobs somewhere else or setting their own company up. And back then, games were a lot smaller. Uh, the games we were working on were, were like games for the Sega Genesis was actually what I was working on at Malibu. And what we started working on, the very first game we did at Neversoft was supposed to be a game for the you know, the Sega Genesis, 
which is this this console where you plug in a cartridge and it's got hardly any memory and the, the graphics are terrible. But then you know, the games are fun. Uh, but it was easier to do a game back then. You could do it with do with just you know one programmer and one artist, and you know, oh wow, you get get a musician to do some music and then some sound effects, and and you're done. So, uh, you know, the teams were getting a little bit bigger around that time, but but really, you know, it was it was very very small teams. So to start a company didn't mean you had to hire like twenty people. You could just start working with a handful of people. So was the idea like anyone that maybe would start developing a game like, okay, let's just do this on our own and sell the game to them as opposed to working no. for some big company? No, the, the, the game, the idea was to work for some big company because we were okay. young. We didn't have any money. So yeah. we, we couldn't get, we couldn't develop our own game because we, you know, we had like literally no money. Like and Joel took out a, a loan on his house. But Chris, the other founder, and I, you know, we had no money. We were living paycheck to paycheck when we were in Malibu. Yeah. So we had like, you know, $2,000 in the bank each. Uh -huh. uh, and and so to start a company, we had to get a, another company, a publisher, to kind of agree to come with us and uh, and give us a game to do and and pay us. And even then, we were on a month-to-month -month basis. So it was, it was very, very touch and go uh, for oh, the sure. first few months. Which is one of the benefits of being young is that you can kind of take a risk like that. You know, we I didn't have a family. I mean, Joel had a family, but you know, I didn't yeah. uh, uh, have any family. Chris didn't have a family at the time. Uh, so you know, we're like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's let's start our own company. It'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> it was eventually it was great, but it was uh, started out a lot of hard work. Oh, I'm sure. What what was that first game that you guys were <laughs> developing for Sega? It, it was uh, a game called Skeleton Warriors, and okay. it was actually for a company called Playmates Interactive, which sounds sounds like a porn company. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, as, uh, it was actually it's a Japanese toy company uh, who who did a cartoon called Skeleton Warriors. I can't remember the, exactly what their name was. Something like that. I think it was yeah. Playmates. Yeah, or playthings or something, something that sounded a bit sketchy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and they wanted to just do a game. And yeah, we were like Sega Genesis programmers. So we started doing it on the Sega Genesis, but then the, the PlayStation came out. And so they said, oh, well, you know, we want to, we want to switch it up. And actually, it, was, it wasn't even the PlayStation then. It was the Sega Saturn, which is like Sega's version that. of the PlayStation. Yeah. I remember yeah. It didn't that. do as well. But the thing about no. the Saturn was it came out first. Uh, so it was out for a few months before the PlayStation was. So everyone started doing games on the Saturn. I remember I had this big dev kit on my 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 desk. You know, it cost something like thirty thousand dollars. We didn't pay oh. for it, yeah. uh, and it was like this big box, like a fridge type thing, and then another big box right next to it, which is the the debugger, and it was all this prototype hardware, and it was it was really kind of cutting edge stuff. But you know, it was still it was just a Sega Saturn. It wasn't the most amazing thing in the world. But it, it, it was it was kind of fun to kind of get your hands on brand new hardware and start programming a brand new game for it. Oh, I'm sure. Um, what so what became of of Skeleton Warriors as far as like for the Saturn? Y'all eventually switched up to developing yeah, for PlayStation. That, yeah, we we dropped the uh, we dropped the Genesis version, the 16-bit yeah. version, but we did do a Saturn version and and a PlayStation version. In fact, we wow. the. Saturn version came out first, and then we did a quick conversion uh, to to the PlayStation. Uh, Interesting. And, quick yeah, conversion. So they, what does that mean exactly? Um, I, well, I, you, I know you're getting it ready for that console, but yeah, sort of yeah. I mean, in layman's terms, what does that entail? Uh, yeah. it, it means you don't really add anything specific to to the PlayStation. Like anything the Saturn can do, the PlayStation can do. That there's some differences in the way like the memory is is laid out and the way you you have to do things. But if you kind of you know, abstract all the the bits of code that are to do with drawing things on screen, then all of the kind of game logic is is the same. Uh, so you can keep some parts of the code uh, that doesn't change. It's the same code actually. Was it? I can't remember if. It might actually be fairly different actually now I'm thinking about it because it was uh I can't remember what what language you programmed in. It's all getting rather fuzzy. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> can a imagine. It was ago. a long time ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh so yeah, what came we, after that game? Yeah, after after um Skeleton Warriors, uh this was kind of like a kind of a tricky time for us, really, like uh, at, at Neversoft. Um we 
we started working on some other games, uh, but they didn't work out. We were doing a game called uh, a Ghost Rider game, game based on the Ghost Rider franchise. Oh wow! And, which is kind of similar in a way to the Skeleton Warriors thing. It was like a side-scrolling type of thing. Uh, that, that ended up not working out, and then we were kind of we did a prototype game called uh, Big Guns. Uh, which was like a mech shooter game, which was which was pretty cool. And then Sony uh, signed up to do that, and then that didn't work out. And then we were kind of shopping things around. Uh, well, whilst that was happening, we did a conversion um, of a PC game called MDK uh, to okay. the PlayStation, uh, which was you know, kind of a, a fun, challenging thing to do. But uh, you know, we oh, okay. uh, that that worked out. Uh, it was it was tricky because like PC games back then used like eight megabytes of memory and the PlayStation only had like you know one and a half or two essentially but really not, only about one and a bit. Oh wow! Uh, so it was it was difficult to shoehorn everything in. Uh, and then we did a game called Apocalypse, which was a game starring Bruce Willis, uh, pretty much as himself, but it was this just futuristic shoot 'em up. Now what happened there was Activision had signed on. Excuse me, Bruce Willis. Activision has signed up Bruce Willis, a you know, big movie star, uh, to, to do this game. And they had this real high concept, this real novel idea that they were going to have Bruce Willis would be your sidekick and you would be the main character running around shooting things. And Bruce Willis would help you using AI to to help you. And this was back, you know, in the in the like, late 90s. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it didn't work out. The company they they picked like did a, you know, they they couldn't. It was beyond their capability. So they couldn't figure out how to get the game to work, and you know, the it wasn't fun. So they basically fired this company, and they came to NeverSoft. Or I think we'd come to them. We show them this Big Guns game, and uh, they said, "Oh well, yeah, that that Big Guns kind of looks like what we were trying to do with this Bruce Willis game." And so they were like, "We'll just we'll super simplify the Bruce Willis game. We'll make Bruce the main character. We'll get rid of the other stuff, and you'll just do a fun game around it." And also, here's all this video that we've shot already, and you have to make the game based on this video. Uh, wow. So I had to t- I took all the video and went through it, and then kind of you know, figured out how we could edit it so it would work, and then just designed levels for the game based on this existing video, which was for a different game, but uh, we made it into this new game. We made this fun game. It's and it was it's quite it's quite well uh, remembered by by some people. Apocalypse. It was a fun little game, fun little shooter. Wow, man, I love Bruce Willis. Uh, I'm a yeah, Die Hard's like my favorite movie, um, you know, of all time. Uh, you know, that's crazy. I never heard of this uh, game, to be honest with you. I'm not much of a gamer, so um, there's a lot of stuff. Even though I did a lot of research, there's still stuff that's gonna just get brought up. I just don't know about. Yeah, um, yeah. Apocalypse yeah, isn't the most uh, most famous game. Uh, in some ways, it's most famous because it was a precursor for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Okay, in what way? That's interesting. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to a... cough a little bit. Of course, of course. Hmm, bronchitis. All right, so... So Bruce Willis brain. is uh, Apocalypse uh, was was you know the, it was the game that saved NeverSoft. We were about to go bankrupt. Activision had this game they needed doing, and so we we did this fun little game saved uh, saved NeverSoft, saved Activision's bacon because they managed wow. to get a game out by Christmas, and you know, they've invested like millions and millions of dollars in it. I think they paid Bruce Willis like like five million dollars or twenty million dollars or something just just for his name wow. uh, to go on this game, and you know eventually. Worked out. They didn't. They didn't make a loss, uh, which uh, which was great. Uh, and then they they suggested to us the idea of of doing a skateboarding game, and this was something that Activision did. And we were, you know, yeah, it, was, it was kind of interesting, but we we don't know. We'll, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. It could be kind of fun. And then you know, very quickly we got very excited about the idea. But they wanted a prototype. Uh, the idea was that they would pay us for four months. You know, we were still on month to month. Uh, payments as a company back then we had no real money in the bank yeah uh, so we needed this regular income so they said we'll give you four months you know you'll give us something every month and we'll give you your your, your money uh, and then we'll see how it goes and so we had to get a a working prototype up there so what we did was he took apocalypse this game with bruce willis running around and we just stuck a skateboard underneath bruce willis's feet 
and <laughs> use the same model and the, and the same the same levels of these rooftop shooting uh, things and had him like skate around over these these rooftops with a gun strapped to his back. Whoa! And that, <laughs> that was the first prototype of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, which wasn't called Tony Hawk's at the time because we didn't even even have a name for it. We just called it Skate. Uh, wow. And we, we built and we built that upon that that foundation uh, into what we have uh, yeah, today. Well, what we had a few years later. That is crazy. So Bruce Willis was the first Tony Hawker, yeah. if you will, uh, on the game. That's uh, that, that's, that's yeah, that, my mind to be honest. That's uh, in, in in the code. It reverberated through the code as well because we we built you know the the bruce willis game upon the big guns code so there were yeah. some references to big guns in there but we we did all this code for the character moving around and you have like what's called a class inside the code and uh we call that class c for class and then bruce so c, the c bruce object is what moves around <laughs> the screen wow. and in all the code for the shipped version of, of tony hawk's uh pro skater the first version uh it, we still had that c bruce as the name for the wow. skater in the code. Wow. Holy cow. We probably had some leftover gun code as well and stuff like that. You could actually probably shoot if you hacked it a little bit. No kidding. That's an interesting take to have a shooter on the the Tony Hawk skating get like that would have been interesting for sure. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It was, it's that, that's how it works. You, know, you you reuse code all the time. Essentially it's sure. it, it, now it's usually it's kind of ripped out into a separate engine. But back then, you would kind of take the previous game that you did, and you would Build on you know, try, you know, take as much of the sp specific code out of it, but and and reuse it again. So we had this uh, C Bruce running around, and then C Baddies for the uh, the whatever the NPCs were back then. <laughs> so the game sort of came together very quickly as far as the dynamics and how the character skated, because that's what made that game so unique was sort of the angle you had and really just how it worked so well yeah yeah it's it, it did it took a, a little bit of evolution uh it wasn't the game that we originally set out to build uh we originally thought it would be more like just a downhill almost like a racing game you, know, you would it you would start at the top of the hill and you come down and there'd be all these half pipes and big jumps and things. So you're thinking something more like, you know, SSX, uh, it's like okay. snowboarding game. Yeah. Uh, or there was a skateboarding game called Top Skater, which is an arcade game, which actually had a, a skateboard in it. Uh, it probably wouldn't be allowed now because it was pretty dangerous. But you would balance on this skateboard and you would hold these two rails on either side. And and it was this kind of same type of thing, a downhill racing game, essentially. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd have a timed run down one course. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first version of the game, which was, you know, it's kind of fun. But we also, you know, wanted to have like, you know, skateboarding culture type things. And at the bottom of this ramp, there was a warehouse, which had like, you know, like a, a pool in it and a half pipe and some ramps. And uh, it turned out that people enjoyed playing around in this warehouse a lot more than they enjoy going down this 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 race. Because you go to the race, you do every jump like once. Sure. But in the warehouse, you jump in the pool and you're up, being down, up, you do your tricks, you do down, you do jump out, you grind on a rail. So you, you can you can do all these fun things over and over again and do these these loops and circuits. It's actually turned out to be a lot more fun. And so we we moved away from the the downhill uh idea more towards this kind of open world concept. So that's why there's there are some particular spots that is downhill quite a bit, yeah. like as part of it, right? So I'm assuming that just stemmed from that essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. There's there's three levels in the first game. Uh, there's like a canyon level. There's a mall level. I think there's one more. Maybe there's just two. Uh, which which are based on that original concept. So yeah. you would have like a you know a level like the school, like the, the, school, the very yeah. the very first level, I think. Uh, which is this nice open world with a few different areas in it, but you can kind of go around it. You can do a circuit around it on on grinding the rails and hitting points. Uh, and then, you know, interspersed with those, we had these these downhill jam levels. Uh, but you know, the downhill jam levels weren't as much fun as the skating around the school levels. So that's more to what we gravitated towards. 
did anyone did any of y'all like skate were you know skaters yourselves and knew how to add or how did y'all how did y'all well, add that element and how did tony hawk get involved well i i, I didn't know how to skate uh yeah. some of the other people did to, to various degrees um uh, i mean J joel uh you know was like skated a little bit in his youth but he got so into it that he built a half pipe in his backyard wow and he learned to skate and he he got pretty good at it he could he could drop in from fairly high half pipes there's uh, uh there's footage of him at e3 you know, the big trade show where we we showed the games back then uh, of him like dropping into the half pipe and then just slamming his face into the ground <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but he did it <laughs> well wow. he, you know, he tried he yeah, yeah, I think, I think he actually go. he actually did it at one point, but uh, you know he also he, uh, uh, he left a little bit of blood on the on the yeah. on the floor. <laughs> oh, but yeah, so there was a few skaters there, uh, but mostly not. Mostly the way we we got into skate culture was by watching skate videos and like looking at skate magazines. So we'd get uh, like every lunchtime we'd gather around the big conference table and we'd put a different skate video on the tv and we'd watch it so we'd get very familiar with the various uh skaters you know at that time and we'd get familiar with with you know some skate spots and uh and just basically what uh skating looked like you know what skate culture was like and especially like what skate videos were like yeah uh, that's, and that's we really tried cool to incorporate that. all of that into the game like you know in the first well throughout the whole all the whole series like the thing you collect is these videotapes there are hidden videotapes at various points uh, and that's just ah. you know direct nod to to skate culture which is all about you know, making skate videos sure. uh, and of course it was all analog back then very few digital cameras um and then there was thing there were sections of the game where you had to kind of make your own skate video uh, you could you could record things when they would do replays and we tried to make the replays have camera angles that were like skate videos you know, you get wow. that low shot and following the skater across and things like that. And then the far shot jumping over the skater, the camera flipping. Because yeah. uh, we wanted to re wanted to capture as much as possible of that of that type of feel of being in skate culture. And then Tony Hawk comes along. Um and what happened there, I think, was basically Activision needed a name to put on, you know, it's like you know, Madden's uh, football game. Sure. Uh, who whose skateboard game is it going to be? And I think Tony Hawk kind of became the obvious choice. Uh, I think Bob Burnquist was another name that was floated around. I think he actually ended up going uh, with another skate game, which uh, maybe Thrasher, I think, uh, or maybe another one. But uh, he went with a different skate game, didn't do as well, ended up coming back as one of the skaters uh, for the next game. But Tony Hawk became the big the big name in skating. He was very famous. Uh, and Activision signed him up. And I think after we signed him up, he was in the X Games and he landed the first 900 uh, yeah. ever in, you know, in, in skate history in, in competition. Uh, and, you know, that was a huge thing. You know, it was like, you know, even, even huge outside of skate culture. It was like this big fun thing, uh, especially because the actual event itself, and you've probably seen it on video, it's just, it's just so amazing. Like the, the whole energy of uh, all the other skaters like cheering him on to land this 900 and so he just became at that instant the most famous skateboarder in in human history and that yeah. tied in perfectly with our with our game and so he was on board he was ready to did he come in and offer tips and this and that or he just kind of like my name's on it and that's no that's he it. was he, he was very involved with it he he, he didn't come in uh that often I mean, he did come in but what we would do is we would every week we would burn him the latest version of the game and oh, wow. uh, and have it sent to him so he would have it for the weekend uh and then he would play it and you have his friends come around skater friends come around and play it and then he would give us feedback and wow. you know tell us like what you know, if something didn't seem right or even just like regular like gameplay feedback he would he would tell yeah. us like you know it doesn't feel right or you know, maybe it would feel better if you did this and so we you know, we'd incorporate that but he was involved throughout uh, the process of uh, pretty much all of the early versions of the game. So he he really liked the game himself, and obviously having y'all develop it sort of like that behind the scenes is probably why it came out just so well. Um, I think, right? I mean, yeah, it yeah, like it's benefit. It, it was it was very good having him there uh, for input. Uh, we we 
we relied a lot on feedback from from people you know like him but also from you know our target audience sure uh you know we're not selling to an audience of tony hawks we're selling to an yeah. audience of, <laughs> of of kids uh, a lot of whom d don't even skate you know some of them do but you know most of them probably don't uh, so we also did a lot of focus testing where we would get uh, kids to come in i think uh uh, we had someone who knew like the parents at the local high school and we got them to agree to let their kids come and play the game for a while. And we'd sit behind them and watch them and, you know, try to figure out how to make the game better. And, you know, the kids would give feedback, but it was mostly stuff like, whoa, this is tight, man. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we'd have to kind of you know, try to interpret that and, and try to figure out, you know, how, how to improve the, the game based on which bits they thought were tight and which bits were not tight. <laughs> uh, but we, we did it. <laughs> we did a good job, I think, uh, in the first, the first game. And uh, oh, you know, we could tell what people were liking it. Uh, and, and then another big thing that happened that we could tell when people were liking it was we did a demo disc version you know back then you would distribute demo versions of the game on cd and you you get like eight or ten different bits of of various games on one disc and they would like give them away at supermarket checkouts or you'd get it with your pizza like Domino's would deliver you a a demo disc uh for free and it was just a way of distributing uh the yeah. the, the game out there you had the demo version of the game before you know, there was any internet and people really liked this demo and they were playing it a lot and it was basically just i think like the uh the warehouse level i'm not even sure if it was like the warehouse level that we included in the the final game it was the one that was at the bottom of the downhill jam during our prototype or something like that but it was you know it's just some some half pipes and some pools and some ramps and some rails but it was yeah, it was a heck of a lot of fun, and people really enjoyed playing it. And we knew at that point that the game was going to do really well. Oh man! So how long did it take to from development to launching the first game? And on what system did y'all launch the first game? Uh, the the first game was was on the PlayStation, Sony PlayStation. The first uh, PlayStation, PlayStation One, yeah, PlayStation, PlayStation One, yeah. And uh, basically, the the development of each game was just under a year. Okay. Um, wow. So I think we kind of finished the the previous game, Apocalypse, towards the end of of the previous year. What that being like ninety eight? Uh, would it be no? It would be nineteen seven. Ninety. Let me see. Let me see. We got. Hmm. Oh yeah, we did. We did the the. It started kind of in ninety eight, like mid ninety eight was when we did the prototype. Then we had to be finished by kind of like late summer of of ninety nine. Okay. Uh, oh. so it was like you know a bit over a year if you include the prototype. But each subsequent game after that was one year. We were on a strict one year cycle because the games had to come out by Christmas. Sure. Uh, and yeah, so the first game was on PlayStation 1. Uh, second game was also on PlayStation 1. And the third game was on the PlayStation 2, which was kind of a welcome relief to do something that's a bit more uh, uh, fancy in terms of uh, its processing power. Sure. Uh, and we we did also did conversions to, to other systems, like uh, Nintendo 64, I think we did a version of, of, of the game for that at the same time as doing the PlayStation version. But the PlayStation was always our lead platform. Like okay. each each version of the game was basically focused around the PlayStation because that was the most popular platform out there. And then either we would do a conversion or someone else would do a conversion to the, the other platforms. Right on. When, when did y'all know that this game was a hit? Like when did that exactly happen? On this first, on the very first one? Yeah, well, it's kind of when the reviews started to come in uh yeah, with the first the first game and we got really really good reviews and that was before we got any sales numbers okay and so we got all these magazines giving us you know like five star reviews or 98 percent or whatever like really really high scores and, and then you know we started to get some sales figures in and we could see it was like you know basically going to the top of the chart fairly quickly uh, and uh, it's that just continued. You know, we got good reviews, uh, we got good sales, and then we you know, started working on the sequel because you know we knew it was doing really well. 
we didn't really know exactly how well it was doing, but we know it was doing good and it was in the, it had enough legs to do at least at least one more version sure. uh, of the game. And so we started working straight away on on a sequel and uh, didn't stop. <laughs> yeah. What what's the most popular iteration of of them? Uh, it it kind of varies, but based on who you talk to, <laughs> I think Tony Hawk Two is one of the more popular amongst kind of the the older crowd because they kind of remember yeah. it very fondly. Because Tony Hawk One was was a good game, but it was kind of limited in the way you could uh, kind of string tricks together. And in Tony Hawk Two, we we added uh, a move called the manual, where you would you know land on your nose wheels or your your tail wheels after a trick, and then you could continue uh, to uh, like skate over to a rail or something like that, get on that rail, uh, and then continue uh, the trick. Uh, and uh, that's kind of like made the game much more fun. Sure. Uh, so a lot of people really like that, but then some people like Tony Hawk Three. It's gonna it's an interesting game. It's, it's the first game that we did where we changed the frame rate uh, to 60 frames per second, which oh, wow. I think was a, a very important part of the game. The, the feel of the game changes. Not everyone agrees. We had some dis discussion uh, in Neg Neversoft whether it was worth it or not. Because if you if you change the frame rate to 60, that means you can draw less things on screen. Uh, okay. So it's a little, little trade-off. Like the artists don't like it because they can't put as much art uh, up there. But the game sure. players, uh, I think, feel the difference. And this is something I, I kind of argued for. Uh, and also, the, the engine we were using uh, for Tony Hawk's 3 wasn't that good. So you also couldn't get very much on there. So the game ended up feeling like very empty, which is kind of cool. It's like you were skating around these deserted versions of cities. Like there was an, an LA level, and it was like LA with with no traffic. Uh, so yeah. it, was, it, was, it was kind of a, a weird... A serene experience because there's there's nothing but you and the city and the ramps and you could do your lines endlessly through it. It was it was kind of fun, uh, but I think you know overall, a lot of people liked Tony Hawk's Underground because uh, it was a game that had a lot more narrative in it, a lot more story, and a, a lot of people kind of related to that and they they enjoyed the process of of going through uh the various stages of the story and growing as a skater because it's about it was about a young skater and tony hawk's like the uh uh the advisor in a way uh so it you know people have different you know they can take different things from games like me myself i'm i'm generally not that interested in the story i'm more of a pure game playing person i just sit there and play the game up down you know go on the ramps yeah. and do the do the lines and everything. Uh, other people like to have that that narrative that carries them through a game as well. So you know, some people would say the early versions of the game because they're nice and simple and pure gameplay. Some people will say the later versions because they have a story that they can relate to. Wow, how, how many? They're still making the game right to this day. Uh, not not exactly. What what happened was, I think there was about nine versions of the original game in the original series. Uh, then there was kind of kind of a, a version of the game where they had this skateboarding peripheral. I can't remember what that was called, but it 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 didn't do very well because it was very hard to actually play the game on this thing. It really wasn't very well suited to it, and it that wasn't done by NeverSoft. It was done by a different company. Uh, but most recently, there's a version of the game called Tony Hawk's One Plus Two, which is basically the first two versions of the game, uh, plus I think some bits from other versions, uh, updated to modern technology. So it runs on, on modern consoles, very smooth, very high frame rate, uh, very, uh, um, very good graphics. And they did an excellent job of, of, of capturing the original gameplay of the game uh, so it feels very very similar uh, to the to the early versions of the game but it's upgraded to all the all the mod cons uh, of the modern console and uh you know sort of I, I recommend you know if someone wants to get into tony hawk then that's certainly the the version to to go for right on what well, was tony involved with all the iterations or just that initial one did he no, he was over he, he was he was involved and he was probably contractually obligated to be involved yeah. <laughs> to, to some degree. Sure. Uh you know, it, it was it was you know, he, he got many, many millions of dollars 
uh from from his involvement uh in the game sure of course uh, so you know it's uh, and but he he was enthusiastically involved in in the development and he would do you know whatever was asked of him you know at one point we did a, a motion capture session we had him like dressed up in you know black leotard with his little white ping pong balls attached and have him do a whole bunch of moves uh that that basically we only did it for publicity we didn't actually use the data from that in the game because it was you know the the guy who was doing the animations at the time found it was a lot easier just to kind of look at the video and and do the animation based on the video rather than use the motion capture data because it was it's kind of messy it wasn't quite as sophisticated a system as we have now you know obviously later like never soft eventually ended up doing their own in-house motion capture studio for for the various games but you know back then it was a, a new technology but yeah tony hawk did that without without any complaints uh even though he looked rather silly doing it but uh, <laughs> it was it was a fun thing to to do no that's awesome what other games were y'all excited to uh to develop uh through through that i read something about guitar hero spider-man yeah spider-man was uh the first game we did kind of after tony hawk uh that that, that was that was kind of interesting because we didn't know how successful tony hawk was going to be yeah uh, we knew it was it was selling well but you know we we were a young company and we were trying to grow and so uh, we thought that at the time the way to grow the company would be to do two projects and so we we said like oh well we'll we'll, we'll take this the skateboarding team uh and they'll do skate and then we'll you know take a few people from that and we'll hire a bunch of more people and we'll set up a second team and the second team was going to do the spider-man game and they did. So we basically had two teams in the building at the same time doing two games in in the same time period. Uh, I I didn't work that much on Spider Man. I did like a a, a little bit of stuff uh, on it, but that was mostly I think uh, Dave Dave Cowling was the lead programmer there, and Chad Finley was the the lead designer, uh, and I was you know on 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 Skate. But uh, you know that was a real fun little game, the, the Spider Man game. And sure. just, yeah, it would have been nice to do more of that. But and Tony Hawk Two was selling, and it was selling so well that Activision decided that you know we need to do like a really good uh, Tony Hawk Three, and that of course is when the PlayStation uh, Three version was coming out. And so we then took those two teams and combined them into one mega team, which was just just doing Tony Hawk. Uh, and and so that's that's kind of you know where, where we were for the next like uh, three years after that, just doing Tony Hawk games. Uh, then yeah, I actually left after Tony Hawk Five. At uh, after I think that was stuck. Tony Hawk's Underground. So I think we just started working on uh, Tony Hawk's Underground Two, and we'd also just started working on a game called Gun, which was a a Western game. So that was okay. like the the second kind of you know different different type of game that we did after uh, that, and you know I, I was kind of getting a bit bored with the games industry. I wanted to leave and do other things, uh, so I left at that time. Uh, but then they did Gun. After Gun, they did Guitar Hero, which was oh. uh, you know an inc incredibly popular game. Of <laughs> Made them lots more money. I should have stayed yeah. for for that. Uh, <laughs> after that, they worked on Call of Duty. And yeah. uh, sure. uh but at wow. the same time they were they were doing you know they were doing Tony Hawk games all the way through all the guitar heroes, they're doing guitar hero plus Tony Hawk. The company grew up to be massive. Uh then the Tony Hawk sales started to to decline after you know, after 10 games or so, people sure. you know, want something different. Yeah. Uh and so they, they were focusing more on uh guitar hero, and that was starting to decline as well. And so they kind of started doing the Call of Duty game. Uh, uh, and that was kind of like the last series of games that Neversoft worked on before they were finally kind of absorbed by the greater Activision studios. Yeah, I mean, obviously Call of Duty is just one of like the most massive games ever. But people do regard to like Tony Hawk Pro Skater, and I'm not sure which version, but what I read like as literally one of the greatest video games of all time. That yeah. must feel pretty good. Uh, to know yeah. that it was built off of Bruce Willis is like <laughs> great. I mean, what a great story. Yeah, I think that was, I think the one that the 
got listed as one of the greatest of all time was Tony Hawk Two. Yeah, uh, because it was it was. You know, I think at, at when that came out, we had number one and number two in the charts wow. uh, at the same time because wow. they'd re-released Tony Hawk One on the you know the the slightly more budget label uh, where they put them in the little jewel cases rather than the, oh. the big cases. Uh, uh, yeah, they were, and, and yeah, it's it was it was. Uh, a very entertaining time being <laughs> being having all these like very uh well-regarded games uh you, you kind of got used to it in a way and it perhaps made us a little 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 cocky uh about what we did but we you know we still churned out very good games year after year uh for for a long time so i you know, i don't think anyone can really complain about the the early versions of the game Oh my gosh! Are you kidding me? Um, yeah, I mean, you guys develop just games that will be in, in people's memories, you know, forever. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's that's that, pretty cool. That's what I, I I love about it is is I I constantly um have people tell me that they enjoy playing the games. It's interesting that those people are getting older and older. <laughs> sure. Uh, like, you know, the guy who came around to uh, fix my air conditioning or whatever, like, you know, I mentioned to him what I do and he'd be like, oh yeah, I played that when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> like, so oh shit, uh... how old is this game? <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, it was, it was, what was it? Uh, uh, late 90s, like 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, a so lot it's... in gaming, right? Like, that's a yeah. huge uh, discrepancy for where yeah, the first one. games are now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we've had like retrospective documentaries and things about it. And, you know, I get invited on podcasts to talk about it. Some of it, I can't remember what actually happened, but sure. <laughs> it, was, it was a good time. Tony was there. We made a game. Yeah. Bruce Willis. You just like throw out all the. I got my uh, skateboard there, uh, my birdhouse skateboard, which is uh, what Tony gave to us uh, after we finished the first version of the game. Oh, wow. So that's like a 20 something year old skateboard. Never wow. been, well, very, 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 ridden very little. Sure. Uh, but yeah, and it was Tony did them, signed them. So it could be a collector's item one day, I guess. Oh, I'm sure. Are you kidding me? Do you yeah. game now? Are you like a regular sort of gamer? I mean, no, not really. Uh, occasionally, I will get into to some 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 game, and then yeah, you know, I find myself getting too addicted, and so I stop playing it. But I haven't really done anything uh, recently. Uh, you know, I used to like games like um, uh, uh, Warcraft or Starcraft, uh, and you know, older games like Halo, yeah, you know, simple shooters, stuff like that. Uh, Zelda games, but uh, I guess the only game I play now with any regularity would be uh, Mario Kart, which is uh, my my default uh, <laughs> fun party game. Absolutely, um, yeah, I play a little Call of Duty uh, with my friends here and there, but I'm definitely not a gamer. And I just picked that up like a year ago because everyone lives like in different parts of the country, so it was a way yeah. for us to sort of hang out uh, virtually, if you will, and and do something while we. While we do it, how much did that sort of change games like bringing in the Internet and like this sort of community gaming that, you know, before you had to sit with somebody in their living room or in their bedroom and play the game. And that was fun. That was yeah. the exciting part about it. I'm curious what your opinion it, on like it, how that changed it. It it, it did change it. I mean, the, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 was actually the first uh, online game for the PlayStation, uh, oh, wow. PlayStation 2. Uh, and it, we actually shipped the game before uh, Sony's network adapter shipped. So you, you could only play it by getting like a, a third-party modem uh, dongle, uh, which, which would attach to, to the serial port in the back. And so there was very few people actually played it. Uh, for some reason, I made the decision that we were going to do an online version of the game. And so we, we put all this effort into it. But it became like a, uh, even though we never really had that many people playing it, even in the later versions of the game, the online versions of of Tony Hawk were a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed playing them, and you, you know, you do get that kind of sense of online community. Yeah. There are some, you know, fans now who have have taken the code from the game. I think they took the PC version, and they've kind of reverse engineered it because I think you know, Activision dropped support for the online version uh, years ago. And they reverse engineer it so they can set up their own servers and then they can keep playing 
uh, wow. the game uh, because they just enjoyed it so much. You know, they get really into a game like that, an online game like that, and you you just uh, you can play it for hours, and you're playing with real people, and that's what sure. makes all the difference. And of course, yeah. now it's it's much more involved because you got voice and video chat uh, with people in in real time, which is you know something we did not have back then because we had you know we were we were doing uh, network games over modems, so you couldn't do anything more than just transmit the uh, the joystick moves. But oh, yeah, sure. it was it's it, it's 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 a it's a radical change in gaming because gaming was a very solitary pursuit. Yeah. Uh, you know, you'd do it by yourself or with with someone else in the same room as you but being able to do it with this vast world of people out there uh i think it's 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 a great new thing and it's a great it's it's a great thing that actually gives a social life to some people who wouldn't necessarily have one you know people who might just be sitting in in their room playing a game by themselves can now sit in their room and play a game with other people so at least you know you do have some social interaction which can be a start to a broader social interaction so i think it, in 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 net is a, a good thing what do you see as like the where the future of gaming is going like what's the next internet if you will inter internet yeah. connectivity to games vr is that the it's next a tricky thing yeah i i don't know i think your yeah, vr doesn't really have the killer app there are some games that are coming out now that that are a lot of fun and people are really getting into them and you know, the headsets and things are getting a bit cheaper. Uh, so you're getting more people into it. So there, there are a bunch of people who really enjoy VR gaming. It's just not that, that mainstream right now. Like there's a really fun um, kind of exercise game that, that a lot of people really like. This is a VR game. I can't remember what it's called, but that's actually one of the programmers on that was Dave Cowling, who was the lead programmer on Spider-Man and one of the, one of the main programmers on Tony Hawk's pro skater. Uh, so he's wow. he's still in there doing doing great work, uh, but yeah, I think you know VR, perhaps uh, AR, like augmented reality, where you you get like an overlay. But yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of fiddly to make a fun game with stuff like that. I think we might see more stuff with AI, like having AI opponents who appear to be real people but aren't. So you can kind of play with anybody you like, but they're not really that real person. Uh, it's going to be, it's an interesting thing, AI. We don't really know where, where we're going with it and how it's going to impact games, but sure. it's, it's, it's going to be interesting <laughs> no matter what happens. Uh, but yeah, I think we're probably going to see kind of a lot more of the same, uh, where we are right now with games. There's, there's lots of, you know, fun games. Um, you know, some, some like battle Royale games getting very popular, uh, like Fortnite, um, yeah people kind of you know that they they find a new type of game like minecraft something like that and that gets becomes the hot new thing and there's going to be hot new things in the future we just don't know exactly what they are yeah for sure um no what what, what do you think is the besides tony hawk what do you think is the greatest game of all time what what's on your you know top three list i don't know uh i i mean i think you know mario 64 uh is is a classic and that's kind yeah. of one of the games that uh, at the time we we took the idea of mario 64's open world yeah uh because with mario 64 what they, what they did was it like it was a transition uh between like a level based game and a world based game yeah um so we really use that as inspiration. And I think the reason that that was the inspiration was that that was the classic of its time. It was a game that that took a, a genre of platform games and translated it into a three-dimensional world in, a, in an amazing way, which was just so perfect that it has to kind of go down as one of the, the greatest games of all time. Yeah, for sure. I, I remember when that first came out, I was like, oh, it's 3D. I mean, that's what we as kids, you know, yeah. didn't know really how to describe it uh, any other way than that. So Mario and Bruce Willis <laughs> have a lot to do with Tony Hawk. Uh, that That's great. I love hearing this, uh, this insight. Uh, any games that people should be excited about? I know you say you don't game very much, but I don't know. You heard any news about some cool games that are coming out you're excited about? I don't know. No, no, I, 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 I must admit I haven't been following the the games industry and what they're up to uh, right now. 
Uh, so uh, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. Don't don't listen to me. I'm just an old man who used to be a gamer. <laughs> what about systems like gaming system? What's what do you think is the best uh, gaming system or your favorite? It's one? it's uh, it's tricky because like they they're all kind of you know getting to a level now where the games of uh the the changes in the games are kind of incremental. Unless sure. you are like you know a hardcore gamer who wants to like push everything to the max and be running at one twenty, uh, then you know whatever console you 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 pick, the games are going to be they're going to be good and they're going to be fun. Sure, uh, it's, it's in a way like I would I would suggest people look at the games that they want to play, uh, the types of games they want to play more than like the power of the console. Like you you might be a lot better off with a Nintendo than than an Xbox. Uh, sure. if you prefer more kind of like you know fun kid games uh, but if you like shooters then you might want to go with the xbox but if you really like shooters then you might want to go with a high-end pc so yeah. it's kind of depends on the on the individual and on their budget and uh, what, what kind of games you want to play yeah that's awesome what uh so what you know we'll kind of end on this real quick like what what uh i mean what made you want to get into games just period uh, you said there was this british gaming industry i didn't actually know that that yeah. existed um what sort of games came out of the british gaming industry that we would know or are they strictly oh, you, you, you probably wouldn't know them <laughs> yeah i mean so uh, it stayed in england like england specific games that's interesting no the the what what it was uh the british gaming industry grew up around computers that were kind of more popular in Britain, there was the Sinclair okay. ZX Spectrum, uh, which you you may never have heard of, but it was kind of like the British version of the Commodore sixty four. Okay, right, which is this very old school computer with very little memory. It's Commodore sixty four. I guess he has a sixty four k of memory, yeah. uh, which is just very very little point zero six four of one megabyte. Uh, and so the British games industry grew up with basically uh young boys in their bedroom with their zx spectrum writing little games in 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 machine code and then they would send them into gaming magazines and then they would publish the games and the and games companies would 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 distribute these games and they would be sold on tapes like you know wow. if you were a tape you had to put in a tape player and it goes <laughs> kind of like a modem in reverse uh, uh that you would load the game into that so that was the british games industry but of course it grew into do other into other things and there's there's lots of games companies in britain right now um like like uh, rare uh, uh who did the grand theft auto games is is a british oh, game wow yeah from okay. scotland i think uh wow. so it's not like you know we just had this podunk little industry uh we, we had like <laughs> We had like a, a bunch of companies and, and still there still is a pretty vibrant games industry in, in Britain and in Ireland and, and in Europe uh, as well as, as the US. But yeah, so I basically the reason I got into games was that I, I, I was one of those young boys playing with the ZX Spectrum in my bedroom writing little games. But then I, I didn't go straight into the games industry. I went to college. I got a degree in computer science, barely, because I spent all my time writing games in my, my dorm room. <laughs> Uh, and then when I left university, I, I had to get a job because no one was going to give me any money. So I, I was forced to get a job. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'll get a job in the games industry. And so I went, interviewed, showed them like something I'd done on, uh, I think, the Atari ST at the time. And they, they hired me on the spot. Wow. And that's how I got into games. Yeah, I've just always enjoyed making them. And so it was just the natural thing for me to pursue a, a career in. Wow, that's awesome. And you use that now. You use a lot of that knowledge now in what you do, right? Essentially. Yeah, now I'm doing stuff like analyzing UFO videos. And yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the same the same geometry and trigonometry. You just put it in reverse to try to figure out what's going on based on the uh, based on the video. That's great. Like, yeah, see someone like me who has like a food background. I don't know how I bring that chef background to looking into the ufo stuff right like uh unless yeah. i know what they're eating exactly well that could eating. be it yeah look at these cattle mutilations and see which bits uh, are missing and then figure out what type of sausage you would make with it and that'll yeah. tell you what type of alien you're dealing with <laughs> that's hilarious oh man i found a new a new uh, <laughs> a new camino here that i could go down oh that's interesting 
Wow, Mick, this has been absolutely fascinating. I got to say, um, uh, hearing your, your story and how all that came about. And um, I, I really, I can't get enough of that stuff. Um, it sounds like you've had a great, a great life so far. So right? far. Doing, <laughs> right, doing all these things. Yeah, I say so far because there's more to come, Mick. A lot, Hopefully. A lot more to come. Hopefully. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. We'll see. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, listen, man, thanks again so much for doing this. Um, is there anything I missed that you think people should just know? Any fact or anything just to, you know, take us out here? I don't know. I, I feel like I, I want to make sure I, I got no, it. That's cool. Right. No, that's cool. No, I think we covered all the Tony Hawk stuff. I mean, if people want to, like, see my other stuff, like UFO debunking, they can just look me up on Twitter. I'm just Mick West on Twitter or look at my website, Metabunk. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, I'm, there's, there's no real game stuff there. I do have an old blog that I wrote called Cowboy Programming, which has some of my old articles about, uh, you know, how to, how to make things jump and things like that. If you want to see some of my old coding stuff, go to cowboyprogramming.com. That's cool. That's so cool. Well, Mick, I hope you, uh, I hope you feel better, man. Um, you know, get some rest. Thank you for doing this and pushing through. Honestly. I couldn't even tell if you hadn't told me you were sick. I, I couldn't tell until you started coughing there Except for a minute. The uh, <laughs> no, you did great. You handled it well. I'm a complete baby, um, I, you know, when it comes to that stuff. So, you know, congrats to you. Thank you again, man. This has been awesome. Thank you. I really yeah, appreciate fun. it. Uh, you hope, you, uh, hope you feel better. Really? Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mick. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Lone Star Plate Podcast with your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. For more info, go to lonestarplate.show.